Hi everyone, hope you all must be doing great. So today we are starting with another important chapter, but I tell you this is one of the smallest chapter among all five hits, IFOS, income from other sources. It consists of only four sections. First section is section 56. Section 56 tells us about, it is actually the charging section of IFOS. It tells us that what type of income will be covered under this particular hit. So 56 is the charging section. And if we'll uh, go down in 56, if we'll see 56 in detail, then we will find that 56 has two subsections. 56 has two subsection, 56.1 and 56.2. And they both are charging section. They both are charging section. 56.1 is general charging section. It is general in nature. Why I'm saying it general, I'll tell you in a few minutes. It's a general charging section. Whereas 56.2 is a specific charging section. There are certain income which will specifically covered under IFOS, which is covered under section 56.2. So you got it. First section is section 56. It's a, it's a charging section. It has two parts. We will see it in a couple of minutes. Then we have section 57. In 57, we read what are the deductions which are allowed under IFOS. Deductions which are allowed under IFOS, that is all covered under section 57. 58 is deductions not allowed. Uh, you know, I also uh, call this IFOS chapter as mini PGBP because it is somewhat related to PGBP. Although it is very small chapter, but it is somewhat related to PGBP. It is very similar to PGBP in fact. See, in PGBP, we have sections from 28 till 44, right? In PGBP, what is the charging section? 28, correct. Here we have section 56 as under IFRS, one similarity, okay. Second is in PGBP, there are sections starting from section 30 to 37. Do you know what are these sections in PGBP 30 to 37? These are expenses which are allowed under PGBP, right? Similarly, we have a very small section corresponding to these sections. We have section 57 in IFRS. This also says deductions allowed from IFRS. Sounding very similar, right? Okay. And in PGBP, we have some important sections like 40, small A, if you are paying outside India or to a resident, TDS provisions, do you remember that? 40 A to, if you are paying to a related party, it should not be more than the fair market value. Whatever is the excess of fair market value, we are going to disallow that. 40 A3, cash payment in excess of 10,000 rupees, that is 40 A3. What are these? These are expenses which are not allowed. So we have in PGBP these type of sections. In IFOS, we have section 58, deductions not allowed. Are you all getting this? This is very much similar to PGBP. But yes, in PGBP, we have so many provisions, but in IFOS, we don't have that much, right? And uh, there is a section in PGBP section 41, deemed PGBP income, deemed business income, correct? So here we have a similar section, section 59, that is deemed IFOS. So this is, I call uh, this IFOS as a mini PGBP because of these reasons that most of the sections are very much similar to the sections which we have in PGBP. Okay. So first we will uh, revise section 56. Guys, section 56 is a, as I told you, section 56 is a general charging section. It's a charging section of IFRS. Okay, let me explain you. See, section 56, it's a charging section of IFRS. Charging section of income from other sources. And it has two parts. One is 56.1. 56.1 is a general charging section. It's a general charging section. It says that if there is any income, general charging section, I can also say that it is a kind of residuary in nature. It is a kind of residuary in nature. It says in section, if we'll read section 56.1, it says that if there is any income of the SSC. So first we will check it of uh, in th those four heads, those four heads, first we'll, we are going to check it whether they are covered under those four heads. So first, if there is any income, let's say there is an SSC, there is a client who visits your office and he says that, sir, this is my income. So first of all, you have to check whether this is, a, is covered under salary or it is covered under house property 
PGBP or capital gain. If it is covered under those section, then please keep that uh, particular income in those head, right? But if in case, if it is not covered under those section, if it is not covered under those section, then it will be, it could be chargeable under IFOS. So that is the reason I'm saying it residuary. Why residuary? Because we have to check first other sections. So it has, it is residuary in nature. Second, we will apply some more conditions. We will apply, is that income exempt under section 10 or not? So first 56 one says that it is a general charging section. It says if any income is not covered under those four heads, then we can charge it over here. Second, we will ask whether that income is exempt under section 10, because if it is exempt under section 10, then we cannot tax that income, right? Because anyways, it will not go in any of the head because that is an exempt income. Third, we check whether that income is capital in nature or revenue in nature. Because if it is revenue in nature, then only we can bring it under this particular head in under 56 one under this particular section. Because if it is capital in nature, then we will not tax it under section 56 one. I am not saying that capital nature income uh, is not taxable in income tax. It is taxable, but you must you know that income tax is a comprehensive law. Income tax is a comprehensive law. You understand what is comprehensive law? What is selective law? So income tax is a comprehensive law for all types of revenue income. It is comprehensive law for all types of revenue income. It means that if assessee is having any revenue income, it will be taxable. It will be taxable under income tax act unless and until it is exempt, unless and until it is exempt. So all revenue income are taxable. But at the same time, income tax is a selective law also for capital receipts, for capital nature of income, income tax is a selective law. It says that capital income will only be taxable if it is mentioned in this act. If it is mentioned as per the provisions of this Income Tax Act 1961, then only we are going to tax capital receipts, right? So if someone will ask you whether income tax is a comprehensive law, it is a selective law, we will say it is both actually. But for revenue receipts, it is uh, comprehensive. For capital receipts, it is selective. I, I think that you know what is uh, comprehensive and selective, right? So 56, come back to section 56 one. 56 one says that it is residuary in nature. Residuary, you understand if it is not covered under any of the four heads, then it will be covered under this head. If the such income is exempt, then we will not going to tax it. If it is not exempt, then it can come. Third is, if it is a revenue in nature, then only it can be taxed under section 56 one. But yes, we have other section also 56 to. We have other section also 56 to. That is quite specific in nature. It is not general charging section. See here 56 one I have written general, but 56 to is a special charging section. Special charging section means that there are certain income which will specifically be covered under IFOS. We don't check it in any of the forehead because it is not residuary in nature. 56 one was residuary. If there is any income which needs to be taxed under section 56 one, first we have to check in any of the four heads, right? But 56 two is a specific charging section. Special, I have written special, it should be specific. It's a specific charging section. Specific means that there are certain income which will directly come under IFS. We will not check it in any of the four heads. It will directly come under IFS. That is the reason it is specific in nature. I tell you, most of the income are written over 50, in 56.2 and we have to read 56.2 in detail. Okay, come back. So uh, now you got it, what is section 56? So section 56, one says it's a general charging section. Such income should not be exempt first. Such income should not be covered under any other head and it should not be a capital reset. If all these conditions are satisfied, it will be covered under IFOS. But there are certain income which are specific which are specific and they will automatically come under IFOS, right? So what are these? We have to read these. What are, what types of income are mentioned over in section 56 two? So first it says dividend income. Dividend income is always IFOS. Dividend income is always IFOS. So it says that dividend is always taxable under IFOS. If let's say there is a stock broker also, if there is a stock broker also, and in case, because stock broker is someone who is dealing in selling shares or purchasing shares, right? 
So his business is selling of the shares. If he is selling these shares and earning profit or losses or incurring losses, in that case, it is a business income, right? But in case if he is holding some shares and at that time he receives any dividend, so such dividend is always IFS. Dividend income is always IFS. Fifty six two specifically mentions that that dividend income is always IFS, and it also mentioned that if you receive dividend or if you receive dividend in the form of deemed dividend also. So we will see what is deemed dividend. It is mentioned under 222 that we will see um, in a later part of this chapter. So if a person is earning deemed dividend also, you understand there are sub certain sections 222 A, B, C, D and E. So if a person is earning income in the nature of deemed dividend also, then also it is taxable under IFS. So first is dividend income, please remember. Second is casual income. Casual income means winning from lotteries, cross puzzles, etc. Now online gaming is also uh, should be considered over here. We have we know that there is an amendment. There is one more section 115 BBJ which is inserted which says that 30 percent tax will be char chargeable on this online gaming income. I'll tell you that also here in this chapter. So casual income will always be uh, taxable under IFS. Third is shares issued at a premium by a closely held company. Actually, this particular point is uh, applicable only for private companies. Private companies, I can say, is. Uh, not actually private company, but yes, type of private companies. Actually, these are uh, unlisted companies. These are closely held companies. So this section is applicable only for, first of all, please remember, there is a, although there is a small amendment also, but this is a very small amendment which has been made by uh, this Finance Act. But yes, this point is important. This point is important and examiner do ask this point in the exam also. So this is only... Uh, for the closely held companies. So if these closely held companies are issuing shares, if they are issuing shares to some, uh, initially it was to resident, but now the amendment is, now they can issue shares to the non-resident also. Then also this provision will apply. So it says that if closely held companies are issuing share at a premium, please rem remember two things first. First, it should be a closely held company that is a private company or, or it, if it is a public limited company also, but it should not be listed. That is called, we call, that we call as a, closely held company. So first of all, it should be a closely held company. Second, that they are issuing shares at premium. Third is they are issuing share at more than the fair market value. If they are issuing share is at, a, at more than the fair market value, then the excess over fair market value will become the income, right? This we have already uh, discussed that in detail in our regular lecture. I think everybody uh, knows about this uh, particular provision because this is a kind of mechanism where people were converting their black money into white money. So that is the reason income tax came out with this particular point also. Now this is taxable under IFOS. So please remember two, uh, two three things. First of all, it should it is only applicable for closely held companies that is private companies or uh, it will be private companies in your exam, but it also applies on public limited companies also. It is not necessary. They are registered at private. They are public limited also, but they are unlisted companies. That is what closely held. Opposite of closely held is widely held. So it is only for closely held. That is uh, private place. It is not a public listed company. Second is they are issuing shares at premium. They are issuing shares at premium and the excess of excess of fair market value, excess of fair market value would be taxable if they are issuing shares. So IFOS income of such company will be issue price minus fair market value into number of share whatever the number of shares they are issuing it will become taxable so please remember that okay the amendment is that now initially it was like if they issue shares to resident only then it will come under IFS but now it is the scope is now widened now if the, uh, the company is issuing these shares to resident or to a non-resident also both will be covered over there so this is a small amendment which has been inserted here so it becomes important please remember in your mcq this question can be asked that this is uh, abc that uh, for example it's a abc private limited they have issued share to a non-resident which is at premium and also in excess of fair market value then also ifos provision will apply whatever is the excess amount they are this company is receiving over fair market value over face value or over fair market value over fair market value will be taxed right Okay, but yes, this provision is not applicable. There are certain exceptions also. If the company is issuing their shares to these people, then this provision will not be applicable. This actually is part of CA final syllabus. It is also written in your study material that this is a part of CA final syllabus. 
but let me just give a couple of seconds on it so if these shares are issued to venture capital funds or venture ca capitalists then this provision will not apply or if these shares are of eligible startups then also it will not apply this uh, is uh, sufficient you don't have to go in detail over here because uh, it is specifically mentioned in institute uh, study material also that this is dealt in ca final level so we will see this in detail at ca final level soon soon you will be in ca final then we will see this okay fourth point very important we have done this in capital gain also so if uh, there is an assessee whose capital asset if there is an assessee whose capital asset has been uh, compulsory acquired by the government because come government was coming up with some project they would like to uh, build a let's say a flyover they, they are building metro or other thing for that they are compulsory acquiring any uh, land building or any capital asset so in that case you understand that uh, that also give rise to capital gain but they also tell you that we will give you this much compensation and they if they pay you this compensation late they uh, this compensation which you have received it got delayed and due to this delay assessee receives interest so please tell me that interest is it capital gain or that interest portion is ifos so 562 that is our specific charging section of ifos is completely covering is completely bringing that also in ifos head only it is saying that if a person has received interest on delayed compensation that compensation can be original compensation that compensation can be enhanced compensation uh, that is completely not so relevant but whatever the interest which you have received that will become your ifos income but i believe that you have remem uh, you remembered this point also that 50 percent flat deduction is available on it 50 percent flat deduction is available on it that 57 will tell us because 57 what is section 57 sir right now we are doing 56 charging section of ifs after that we will do deductions which are allowed so in section 57 it is written that if you received such interest is 50 percent allowed on all types of interest no only on this type of interest if let's say if assessee is earning bank interest assessee is earning fd interest then also 50 percent deduction is allowed no no it is only and only in case of uh, this delayed compensation interest right or enhanced compensation interest then only 50 percent flat deduction is allowed i have referred this also in capital gain but yes this is part of ifos so if you uh, receive interest on delayed compensation 50 percent flat deduction is allowed so let's say if assessee is receiving 2 lakh 50 thousand rupees so straight away give 50 percent deduction 1 lakh 25 thousand is 50 percent remaining 125 will be taxable as ifs correct so this is important fifth again advance money forfeited we did in capital uh, again there was a section 51 advance money forfeited and you remember that date if this advance money was forfeited uh on or after 1st april 2014 then it will become our ifos income then it will become our ifos income but if any amount is forfeited before this date that is up to 31st march 2014 it was it will not be your ifos income how we will treat that in capital gain we have we have seen that whenever this asset is will be sold by that sac then it will be reduced that forfeiture amount will be reduced from the cost right but that is related to compensation which you the sac has forfeited up to 31st march 14. So any advance money which is forfeited on or after this date 1 for 2014 is taxable in the ifos in that very year in which the amount is forfeited got it okay sixth very important point gifts so uh you understand gifts are taxable under ifos but there are certain gifts which are also covered under salary there were certain gifts which were covered under pgvp and other gifts are taxable under ifos First of all, do you remember salary? We talked about gifts. So if assessee receive gifts from their employer, if the, there is a relationship of employer and employee and assessee is, is an employee and he's, he or she is receiving gift from the employer, then we understand it is taxable as under salary. So if it is cash gift in salary, we have done if it is cash gift, it is fully taxable. Even if it is less than 5,000, if it is a cash gift, cash gift means uh, gift in, in the kind of money, it is always taxable it is regarded as bonus bonus is fully taxable under salary do you remember that and 
if it is gift in kind i'm talking about salary right if it is gift in kind then if the uh, aggregate value of all gifts exceeds 5000 then we tax that otherwise if it is not more than 5000 then we used to exempt that right do you remember that point salary second was in pgbp so if a sesi is uh, having their own business or profession and if they receive gifts from their customers from their clients from their suppliers in the course of business and profession so who are giving them gift their customers are giving them gift their clients are giving them gift or their you know, suppliers are giving them gifts right in the course of their business or profession so that gifts are taxable under pgbp now if you receive any gift which is not in the nature of salary not from employer not from your uh, from uh, due to your business or profession but other gifts other gifts are taxable under ifos other gifts are taxable under ifos but yes we will see what are the exceptions if uh, you are getting the gifts from your relatives then we understand that these would be exempt and in other cases also that we will run but right now as of now just um, know that that other gifts which is not in the nature of salary which is not in the nature of a business and profession other gifts are taxable under ifos so how you will tax this income so first of all we have to categorize these gifts under ifos we will make three category whether such gifts are monetary in nature whether they are in cash by cash i don't actually means hard cash but yes it could be also included but by cash i also mean that if someone gives you check as a gift or a demand draft or fd or any monetary amount right that is will be included in cash gift so first category whenever i'm again repeating whenever you receive gifts if it is in the nature of salary keep it in that head salary if it is in the nature of pgbp keep in that head pgbp but if it is not salary or pgbp bring it into ifos first of all if it is exempt if it is re received from re uh, relatives local authority etc that that we will see in uh, some couple of minutes then it is exempt obviously but other gifts are taxable under ifos let's say if i am receiving gifts from my friends then it is taxable first of all we have to make three categories please remember for gifts we have to make three categories first is monetary gifts like that is gifts in cash first category is gift in cash second gift is movable if they are in kind if they are movable second category let's say if assess is receiving gold assess is receiving diamonds or other such gifts we will keep it in second category third category is immovable gifts so if someone is giving you their land their building so that will cover in the third category do you remember uh, so now it's uh fine with you all so we have to categorize these gifts under ifs into three category cash gift if it is in kind movable if it is in kind immovable third okay so first of all if these are cash gifts if these are cash gift we will aggregate please remember i am using this word aggregate we will aggregate all the cash gifts let's say friend uh, my friend number 1 has given me gift my friend number 2 has given me the gift my friend number 3 has given me the gift so the total gift which i have received during this previous year that is from 1st april 23 till 31st march 2024 i am going to aggregate all these cash gifts this category please keep it separate this category should be kept se separate right we will aggregate all these kind of gifts which are received in cash that is through check demand draft or it could be your fd etc so please aggregate if this aggregate value is only up to 50000 if it is only up to 50000 then no problem please don't make it taxable then you can leave it no tax on it please don't uh, make it as a part of your total income right it could be i can say it as exempt but in case this category this cash gifts the total amount the aggregate amount i'm using uh, again and again the aggregate amount if it is more than 50000 if it is more than 50000 let it, let's say it is 51000 then this entire 51000 will become taxable sir in excess of 50000 or entire amount entire amount will become taxable got it so first category was cash gift second category is movable gift now you have to pay uh, some attention over here so second category is movable gifts movable gifts like sir if i am i have received from my friend i have received car i have received furniture i have received computer 
आई हैव रिसीव मोबाइल फोन दीज आर मूवेबल गिफ्ट तो शुड वी टेक इट द आंसर इज नो 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 these gifts are exempt these kinds of gifts are exempt these are not exempt sir these are movable in kind no you have to take only that gifts which are capital asset in nature for receiver for receiver such kind of gift should be in the nature of capital if they are if they are satisfying the uh, definition the provisions of that definition section 214 that is capital assets then only make it taxable so if you are receiving see personal car is not a capital asset right personal clothes if someone has given us clothes clothes are not capital assets furniture computer laptops purse purse no, these are not capital assets please ignore them please don't bring them in any of the category in movable gifts what we can bring we can bring gold we can bring precious semi precious stone yes these are gifts we can bring archaeological collections paintings drawings designs sculptures any work of art even securities and now virtual digi uh, digital assets also like bitcoins we can bring them over here so if they are please remember for movable gifts please remember i am again and again emphasizing on this point if these are movable gifts please only consider those movable gifts which are capital asset in nature for whom for the receiver for the receiver please look at from the receiver's angle please look at from the receiver's angle they if they are a capital asset in nature then only they will be taxable got it okay so first of all types of gifts if they are in the form of money one category if they are in the form of immovable property my third category but my second category i have written it over here movable gifts but please understand only capital assets are jewelry bullion paintings drawings archaeological collections shares and securities virtual digital assets like bitcoins right so these are only to be considered if they are in the nature of like car if one of my friend has given me car sir this person has given you a luxury car no problem please ignore that will not be taxable that will not be taxable so that's a luxury car are no problem please ignore that right so if gifts received which are not capital assets in the hand of receiver they are not taxable please remember that okay okay so i was talking about movable gifts now you remember that these movable gifts should be capital assets in nature guys you have this is written uh, on page number 7.4 and i believe that you have this book if someone has doesn't have this book please go and download it from the website please go and download this from this website your website it's rajatmoga.com please go and download it it is available for you in pdf format you can go in the download section and you can do this and please start doing the mcqs also mcqs also are also there for you you can easily go and access the mcqs as well okay right gifts under ifs so i was cash gift you understand you have to aggregate if it is more than 50000 then make it taxable if it is not more than 50000 it is up to 50000 exact then you can uh, say that it is not taxable but if it is more than 50000 please make it entire amount taxable right cash gift include check dd etc i have already discussed movable gifts okay now for movable gifts you this category has two sub categories this category this movable gifts has two sub categories right if you have received these kinds of movable gifts like gold jewelry shares etc without any consideration that is you have received it free of cost you have not paid anything but yes it is given to you without any consideration please keep it in a sub category one sub category and other sub category will be for which you have paid something for which you have paid something not adequate consideration see if you have paid adequate consideration definitely it is not a gift let's say if i am getting gold for rupees let's say 1 lakh and i am paying 1 lakh rupees for it so that is not a gift because i have paid adequate consideration but in case if you have purchased at a lesser value if you have purchased that particular asset at a lesser value then it will be taxed over here so you have to make in movable gifts please make two sub categories you have to make two sub categories one sub sub category is that where gifts are received without any consideration that is free of cost you have received it second sub category consists of those movable gifts movable i am not saying immovable immovable is another category right so this sub category of movable gifts includes those gifts which you have purchased at a lesser price at a lesser price you have purchased that is with 
you have paid something but that is inadequate consideration please keep in separate okay first let, let me talk about the first subcategory movable gifts without any con consideration that is free of cost you have received like gold you have received precious semi precious stones you have received shares you have received without any consideration please aggregate them whosoever has given it uh, the the gift to you your friends who have given this gift to you sir if my relative has given no please don't bring relative gifts i i will tell you when these gifts will be exempt it is written over here on next page when these gifts will be exempt but if these gifts are exempt then please don't bring it in any of them in any in any of the category because that gift is exempt you have to take only those gifts which are taxable so which gifts are exempt i'll be uh, discussing that in next 10 minutes right okay so without consideration aggregate all of them and you have to see the market value the fair market value of the, those gifts like should we see the stamp value are these are movable gifts there is no stamp value for movable thing right stamp value is for immovable for immovable i'll tell you look at stamp value but for movable gifts please look at market value you have to aggregate the market value the fair market value and if this aggregate exceeds 50000 make it taxable right then the second subcategory please do not mix these categories please keep them separate the second subcategory aggregate the market value aggregate the market value of all the gifts which you have received during the year from friend one from friend two from friend three aggregate all the fair market value subtract how much you have paid the amount which you have paid for each gift aggregate that and see the difference if this difference that is the amount of saving which you have made saving amount which you have made because you have purchased it at a lesser amount so just get that difference how much is the benefit which you are getting aggregate the fair market value subtract the amount which you have paid right and if this aggregate if this difference exceeds 50000 make this also taxable make this difference taxable whatever this uh, gain which you have made by purchasing it let's say you have purchased a gift for rupees 1 lakh the fair market value of it was 1 lakh but you have paid 10000 rupees for this so how much is the difference 90000 is the difference so if this difference this is the gain which you have which you have received by purchasing at a lesser value so this gain this difference if this difference is more than 50000 then make this difference taxable right so for inadequate consideration this is subcategory aggregate the market value of all such gifts which you have received with inadequate consideration that is you have paid something but at a lesser value you have paid and aggregate the amount of consideration you have paid aggregate the amount of consideration which you have made and please subtract it let's say if you have received two types of gifts at a lesser value for example gift number one is of one lakh fair market value gift number two is of fifty thousand fair market value for gift number one you have paid ten thousand for gift number two you have paid twenty thousand so what you have to do is aggregate the fair market value of these gifts so the fair market value is 150 how much you have paid amount total 10,000 for this 20,000 for this you have paid 30,000 for this so the difference is 1 lakh 20,000 so if this difference is not more than 50,000 ignore but if it is more than 50,000 make it taxable this would be your IFS correct okay now comes my third category that is immovable gifts in these two categories in cash category and movable gifts ca category i was using the word aggregate but here in third one i'll not use the word aggregate here in third in immovable property category you have to see each individual movable immovable gift as separate please keep all these things separate you have to apply that 50000 rupees separately for each asset separately for each asset here i was aggregating in first in second i was aggregating but in third immovable one i will not aggregate i will see each and every asset separately again it has two categories for immovable also it we have two categories for immovable we have two categories first of all first of all we will see what are the immovable gifts which i have received without consideration without consideration means that i have not paid anything let's say i have received land i have received building and i have not paid anything that is received free of cost from my friend has given us to us then keep it in one subcategory second subcategory if you have paid something let's say if you have purchased it but at a lesser value then you can keep it in separate second uh, category 
So for immovable gifts, you have to again make two subcategories that is without consideration. And do you have to aggregate them? No, please keep them separate. Please keep them separate for each immovable property. Please keep them separate. And here you have to see fair market value or stem value. I'm giving you an option. Please apply your logic. Please, you have to see in immovable, you have to see fair market value or stem value. So for immovable, we generally see stem value. So we have to see stem value. Okay. So, okay. First category, immovable gifts which you have received without consideration. If the stem value of individual asset, if the stem value of individual asset exceeds 50,000, make it taxable. If it is not more than 50,000, it is just 50,000 or less than 50,000, ignore it. But if it is more than 50,000, you have to take it as IFOS income. Sir, so should we aggregate? No, please keep all immovable asset separate. Please keep all immovable assets separate. But yes, this category is without consideration. If the stem value exceeds 50,000. Second is without inadequate consideration. Without inadequate consideration, you have to see how much is the stem value, how much is the stem value, and how much amount you have paid. See, if you have paid same amount, then it is not gift, obviously. If you have paid less amount, then it will become gift, right? And you have to aggregate it and you have or you have to see it separately for individually for each asset individually for each, each asset, right? So stem value minus consideration paid. And if this difference, if this difference is up to 50,000, ignore. If it is more than 50,000, make it taxable. But there is one more point also. Do you remember we have done in capital gain section 50C and in PGBP we have section 43C. They are all similar. What they were saying that we can give a grace up to 10% we in stem value and the consideration price we can give a grace up to 10 percent so here you will have to see two things one is fifty thousand rupees second thing also you have to see if the difference is not more than 10 10 percent then also we can ignore so what you will see if such difference exceeds if the difference is more how much either fifty thousand but you have one, one more limit ten percent of the consideration if the stem value exceeds 10% of the consideration, then only you can see, otherwise you can ignore. So it, I believe that you are able to recall this 10% consideration price also. So if the difference is higher of the two here, please just don't see 50,000 rupees. Also, you have to see 10% of the consideration. If that stem value exceeds 110% of the your consideration amount which you have paid, then only it will be taxed, otherwise it will be ignored, right? So here you have to see two things. Now the question arises. Now the question arises of which date stem value we should take, whether the date of registration or the date of agreement, which date stem value in both the cases, which date stem value should we consider? So here we have to generally consider the stem value on which we are getting it. That is on the date of registration. We have to see it generally. General law is that the date of registration should be taken as the stem value. But if assessee claims are this is the property which I have purchased. Actually, it, it has, there is a prior date agreement. There is a prior date agreement. Then you have to prove. Assessee, then you have to prove. And how you will prove? Sir, I will prove if any amount is paid, if any amount is paid, either full consideration or partial consideration, any amount, I'm saying any amount is paid. Just prove that some amount is paid through a banking mode, through a banking mode, not through cash not through bearer check not through cross check it should be what it should be account pay check it should be account pay demand draft it should be your banking transaction if you prove that sir something is paid through a banking transaction then we can take the stem value of the agreement date otherwise we will take the stem value of registration date i believe you are able to recall this point also also second thing is that sir can assessee can also challenge these stem value whatever the stem value was of registration date or value or agreement date can we challenge this also the answer is yes if we would like to get the valuation officer appointed then we can challenge this value also and if the valuation officer brings a value which is less than the stem value which is less than the stem value then we can take that value also but if the valuation officer will bring a value which is more than the stamp value, we will say, sorry, sir, no valuation officer required. We don't require any valuation officer. Sir, he is bringing a value which is more, much more than stamp value. We are not going to take that. So if the stamp, the valuation officer brings a value which is lower than the stamp value, we are okay with, to take it. But if the stamp valuation officer, this valuation officer bring a value, brings a value which is higher than the stamp value, we will ignore that value then. 
civil sir sorry sir valuation officer is not required but if a valuation officer brings a value which is much more than the value which assessee is saying no it valuation officer will not go to that value which is lower than the consideration price in that case we have to stick to the consideration price so this i have already written over here so if valuation officer valuation brings valuation officer brings a value less than the stamp value we can take that value valuation officer brings a value which is more than the stamp value we will say no no sir we don't want this stamp this value because this is much higher than stamp value and valuation officer this he will not bring but still i have written over it over here if valuation officer brings a value which is less than the consideration price so we can go to maximum how much less till consideration price we will not go less than that because this is anyways assessee is saying that this is the price which i have purchased so if valuation officer brings a price which is much lower than that also sir that we cannot take we can take that we can go lower but not less than actual consideration right i believe that you are able to recall these gifts points because these gifts points are very important now the question is that we we know if you come to this page first 7.6 we know that there are certain cases where gifts are not taxable there are certain cases when gifts are not taxable so if they are received from relatives so if it is an indi if the person is individual and he this person is getting gift from relatives or this person is huf this person is getting gifts from huf, uh, HUF then it is not taxable now the question arises who are relatives who are relatives so this i have uh, mentioned in on page 7.5 that who will be considered as the relative so meaning of relative for individual for huf it is easy h for huf members are their relatives but for individual who are relative so it has a good comprehensive uh, uh, relations so there are so many re uh, relatives these are our near relatives we can take the gifts from these relatives so one is first of all you can take the gift if an individual individual if uh, this person is getting a gift from their spouse then it is not taxable spouse is considered as relative second is if we receive a gift from my brother or sister dependent brother non dependent brother no that is not irrelevant if that person is your brother or that person is your sister who are giving you the gift it's okay you can accept the gift from your brother and sister brother and sister never gives gift but still if they give then you can accept it and there will be no tax implications even spouse brother and sister spouse brother and sister that is let's say individual is married uh, to individual is mr a she's he's married to mrs a so if the brother of spouse brother of spouse gives you the gift or sister of spouse gift gives you the gift then also it is not taxable so you can get the gift from your own brother and sister and even you can receive the gift from spouse brother and sister got it okay if you receive gifts from parents brother and sister parents brother that is my father brother my uncle right or my father sister my aunt is giving me the gift so that is also okay it is not be taxable right so parents brother or sister can give you the gift your uncle and aunt can give you the gift linear ascendant or descendant you understand what is linear linear is a straight line ascendant is above descendant is below so if you draw a straight line above you will get your parents you can get the gift from parents your either of the parent your uh, father or mother or if you draw uh, if you go little up then you will uh, get your gr uh, grandparents then you can receive the gift from grandparents great grandparents also you can receive the gift and descendant also that is you can individual can receive the gift from their children also son or daughter even grandson granddaughter they can receive the gifts also spouse of linear ascendant or descendant that is uh, you can receive gift from father or their spouse that is mother or descendant even uh, if you receive the gift from a uh, spouse of descendant let's say if you receive a gift from your son it's also fine if you receive gift from your son's wife your son's wife is giving you the gift then also it is okay exempt and spouse of any person mentioned above let's say brother you can receive the gift from brother you can also receive a gift from brother's wife right brother's wife also can give you the gift that is also exempt you can receive the gift from your sister sister's wife can also give you the gift right 
sorry sisters i am saying sisters sisters husband can give, give you the gift right this relations are so complicated guys okay in hindi i have word but in um, uh, but in telugu in malayalam or in tamil i don't have words um okay Now you can write in your own language right this is easy because in hindi it is easy cha 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 chi and mama mami but uh, you can write in your own language correct that, that that will be easy for you to learn okay so if this person i have also drawn this if this is a person he receives gift from the, his spouse he can receive it he can receive gift from his sister or brother he can receive it even sister's husband can give this person a gift brother wife can give him a gift even he can receive gift from spouse if there is a brother of spouse he can give him a gift a brother wife this is spouse brother and his wife can also give you the gift spouse sister and her husband can also give give you the gift right so these this is all i have drawn it over here your father and mother can give you the gift your grandfather grandmother your maternal grandfather grandmother can give you the gift even the father's brother and his wife can give you the gift your father's sister father's sister is aunt and her husband can also give you the gift similarly son daughter son's wife daughter's wife great grand uh, grandson and his wife granddaughter and his husband and her husband can give you the gift right okay i believe that you got this relations so next page come to page number 7.6 it says so gifts are not taxable this is important gifts are not taxable if you receive from your relative second is on the occasion of assessee's marriage not assessee's son not assessee's daughter whose marriage bride can receive the gift a bride groom can receive the gift right if bride groom's father is receiving the gift that that will be taxable it is not bride groom's father's marriage it is bride's uh, bride or grooms who are uh, uh, who are getting married so in that case they can receive gift they can receive gift from anyone from anyone but yes if they receive gift from their employer it will be taxable on salary even on the occasion of marriage if employer gives them the gift it is a uh, it, it will be considered as salary income this is related to ifos this is related to ifos so if that gift is taxable under ifos but if you are receiving the gift on your assessee's marriage then you can take the gift or under a will or by way of inheritance if uh, you have re you receive a gift under a will or by way of inheritance if you receive it then also it is uh, exempt or on contemplation of death of the payer or donor so there is uh, it means uh, there is a donor there is a person who is on a death bed he is going to die in uh, some days or some weeks and on his death bed he says that the person who is care uh, who is the person who is uh, taking care of that patient so that patient says i am giving you the gift so that is called in contemplation of death because this person was on a death is on a death bed and if he gives a gift to any person then also it is not taxable so this is in contemplation of death if you receive gift from any local authority like gram panchayat or zilla parishad so uh, in villages generally if uh, there is a person who is doing some wonderful job so that local authority can give that person a gift that is not taxable so received from local authority please remember if amount is received from local authority then is uh, then is also not taxable if received from any fund foundation university educational institution hospital medical institution referred in section 1023c no need to remember this section number 1023c but yes if you received such gifts from any fund or any foundation which are registered then you it will uh, be exempt let's say we have tata memorial uh, research cancer research institute so what uh, what do they do is uh, they are one of the pioneer in uh, cancer treatment and they also help people so if they are helping someone they are giving as a gift they are treating them then also it will not be taxable so uh, tata memorial cancer research type of institute if they give gift then it is also not taxable 
trust was institution registered under section 12AA or 12AB. No need to remember again these numbers. But there are certain trusts like Mata Vaishnav Devi Trust, Triput, Triputi tr Trust, or Shirdi Trust. So these are cash rich trusts. So in case Triputi Trust gives someone a gift, then it will it will also they used to help someone, right? Generally, they help if there is any earthquake, natural disaster. Generally, they used to help the people. So if they or if there is any mishappening had happened with someone and they are helping that particular person, in that case also, it will not be taxable. So amount received from these types of trusts, Mata Vaishnu Devi, Tripati Trust or Shedi Trust, these are not taxable. From an individual buyer trust created for the benefit of the relative, see, we understand that if we give, get a gift from relatives, then, then it is not taxable. But if we get a gift from a trust, which is actually created for the benefit of the relative, then it's also indirectly we are getting gift from relative itself, right? Then also it will not be taxable or from such class of person as prescribed. Not so important to learn, but yes, these are something important. On the occasion of marriage, you should understand from relatives who are relatives, you should understand from local authority, from these trusts, you should know that if we receive gifts from these trusts and all, then they will not be taxable. Gift received by the following are also not taxable. This I have already discussed, these institution. This we know, uh, we have already covered this in section 47, that is in capital gain. If there is a holding company, if there is a holding company and it gives some transfers their capital asset to its 100% subsidiary company, which the receiver should be an Indian company. In that case, it we don't tax as capital gain. We don't consider this transaction as a transfer and no tax will arise in that case. That is written over here. So if there is any amalgamation which is happening or any demerger which is happening and the demerged company is transferring some shares to the resulting Indian company or amalgamating company, old company is transferring certain assets to the resulting um, amalgamated com company. I am not, I should not use the word resulting because that is in demerger. If amalgamation during the time of amalgamation, if amalgamating companies transferring capital assets to the amalgamated company, it should be an Indian company, the receiver should be the Indian company, then there is no tax implication which arises. Even if there is a shareholder of any amalgamating company, old company shareholders, and during the time of amalgamation, if he receives shares of the amalgamated company in exchange of his all old shares, then there is no tax implications. No uh, amount would be tax at that particular point of time when he is getting shares of new company. Yes, whenever he will be selling these new shares, then capital gain will arise, we understand, but not at the time of receiving, when he is receiving at the time of amalgamation. So these all these things are written over here. Okay. Okay. C point. This is important, guys. If a person receives amount uh, due to a uh, COVID-19 medical treatment. See, in COVID-19, we will do two things. One is amount received for medical treatment. Second is amount received at the time of death of a patient who was suffering from COVID-19. I'm again repeating. Here, we I'll be discussing with you C point also and D point also. See, in C point, it is written that amount received for treatment. And in D point, it is received, it is written that amount is seen on death of a family member who was suffering from COVID-19. So there are two types. Um, there are two things which are related to COVID-19. One is treatment. Second is on death. First, understand uh, regarding treatment. Regarding treatment, if you receive any sum from any person, from any person, it could be your employer, it could be your it could be government, it could be NGO, it could be even your neighbor also. So if they give, because in uh, during uh, pandemic time, there are so many people who are suffering and also there are so many people who are helping each other, right? So in case, if the person has received amount for medical treatment from anyone, that will be exempt, it will not be taxable, provided it has certain conditions that it should be uh, that amount you, which you have received should be for COVID-19 treatment. So you have to uh, prove it, right? There should be a report of COVID-19. There should be prescribed documents. And you should also inform to the income tax department. Yes, sir, this is the amount which I have received for medical treatment of COVID-19 disease. Okay. So
So first of all, treatment of COVID-19 amount can be received from any person for medical treatment from any person, right? Treatment for self or family member. I, the assessee should have a COVID-19 positive report also and necessary documents of COVID-19 treatment of within six months from the date of COVID-19 positive. So when this, uh, this person was, treat, uh, was diagnosed as COVID-19 positive, so his treatment should be uh, within six months of that particular diagnosis of that particular report. And details of the amount so received must be furnished to the income tax department within nine months from the end of the financial year. So if you satisfy all the all these conditions, then the amount which is received is fully exempt on treatment. Now, second point is if there is a family member or the person who has died due to COVID-19 and if the amount is received on that particular death, right? So in this case, if the please remember two things here, if the amount is received on death from employer, employer has paid something then it will be fully exempt. Whatever the amount is, it will be fully exempt. In salary also, it will not be taxable. It is fully exempt. But if it is received from any other person, it is received from other than employer, then it is taxable in excess of 10 lakh. Up to 10 lakh, it could be exempt. Up to 10 lakh, it could be exempt. In excess of 10 lakh, it would be taxable. This is important. In excess of 10 lakh, it would be taxable. When? This is on treatment or on death. On treatment, entire amount was exempt. But on death from employer, entire amount exempt or from any other person other than employer up to 10 lakh exempt in excess of 10 lakh is taxable. But this exemption of 10 lakh we will give to the SSC provided these conditions are satisfied. So these 10 lakh exemption also SSC has to satisfy these conditions. These are conditions are very similar. The death due to COVID-19, the death cause of death should be due to the COVID-19. Amount should be received within 12 months from the date of death. It should be received within a year. That is 12 months. Second is death of the person must be within six months from testing positive COVID-19. So death should occur within six months from testing of COVID-19. And death certificate or medical report mentioning the death cause is due to COVID-19 coronavirus disease should be mentioned in the death certificate. And assessee has to furnish these details up to nine months from the end of the financial year if all these conditions are satisfied then up to 10 lakh up to 10 lakh we can uh, exempt but yes even if these conditions are satisfied up to 10 lakh can be exempt but about 10 lakh would always be taxable from other person but from employer entire amount is exempt correct and uh, here because in covid 19 it is written that if uh, the treatment or the death has happened for the SSC or for any member of the family so who are family members over here Spouse and children will be covered under family, whether they are dependent or non-dependent. And brother and sister or parents can also be covered, provided they are wholly and mainly dependent on the SSC. Right? Parents, brother and sister, if they are wholly or mainly dependent on the SSC. Right? Okay. So what we are doing, we are doing section 56.2. 56.2 is specific charging section, which tells us that what type of income is taxable under IFOS. So let us continue 56 because we were doing, we were doing gifts. Gift has taken some time. We were doing gifts. Let's continue from gifts onwards. Okay. Seventh point says compensation or other payment which the SSC has received in connection with termination of employment. There are cases, there are cases when the employment gets terminated, Employ, employment gets terminated and you receive certain compensation generally who pays this compensation employer so employer pays these compensation although it will be taxable under salary it should not come under ifos it should ideally be taxable under salary but sometime it might happen that it could not be taxed under salary let's say ssa gives such type of statements that this is a capital receipt this should not be taxable and ssa tries to prove that this is a capital receipt, this should not be taxable under salary, right? Even income tax has uh, played a very smart role over here. In income tax has specifically included this particular thing in IFOS itself. It says that if it, no, if it is taxable under salary, we are happy with it. And in case if assessee try to prove that this is a capital receipt, this should not be taxable under salary. Anyways, you have to pay tax 
we are inserting here specifically under section 56.2. So they have, they have specifically inserted this type of income also. So if it is taxable under salary, we are okay. If it is not taxable under salary, anyways, you have to pay tax under IFS. So this compensation or other payment received in connection with termination of the employment, if assessee receives this, then it will be taxable under salary, we know. But in case if assessee try to evade tax on it, this person cannot evade now because anyways, it will be taxable. If not salary, then IFS, right? Okay. Eighth point, very important, very important. And there is an amendment also. There is an amendment also. It says that if a CC has a life insurance policy, so this is related to life insurance policy. If a CC receives, if a CC has a life insurance policy, any other policy or life insurance, it only talks about life insurance policy. So you understand these life insurance policy are for a very long period. Generally, it is for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. So uh, we get the life insurance policy. We keep on paying premium. And after this life insurance policy matures, then we receive a lump sum amount from this life insurance policy. So the question is the lump sum amount which we receive on maturity, the lump sum amount which we receive on maturity, whether it is taxable or it is exempt. So it can be both. It can be taxable also. It can be exempt also. It is exempt. Generally, it is exempt under section. You don't have to learn this section, but it is exempt under section 10, 10D. 10, 10D is the section under which it is exempt, but there are certain conditions of 10, 10D. If it doesn't get satisfied, then it becomes taxable and it becomes taxable under the head IFOS. That is the reason it is a part of section 56.2. Are you able to uh, get, get this? I'm again repeating. We are doing 56.2. 56.2 is what? IFOS, income from other sources. It says, that if assessee has a life insurance policy, if assessee has a life insurance policy and this life insurance policy, let's say it is getting matured this year. In this previous year, it is getting matured. So we have received a lump sum amount from a sum assured, whatever the sum assured of this policy, we have received this amount. Whether this amount is taxable or it is exempt. If it is taxable, it will be co covered under IFOS. It will be our IFOS income, right? If it is exempt, then there is no issue. We will make it exempt, right? So there is an amendment also, but first of all, I'll discuss what is the provisions regarding this and then I'll tell you the amendment also. Got it? It's easy. Actually, this is also a part, the same thing we used to do in uh, our chapter of deductions also. Whenever we do section 80C, 80C, we understand life insurance premium uh, is one of the eligible investment. Whenever we pay life insurance premium, we can get deductions of, of 80C there. And there are certain conditions. The same conditions are mentioned here as well. Okay. Let me give you a brief background about this. Uh, this is important. That is the reason I am uh, just explaining this to you in detail. Let's say there is an assessee. There is an assessee. Mr. Ashok. Okay. And he has life insurance premium. He has a life insurance premium life insurance policy for which he is regularly paying his premium. Every year he used to pay his premium and this was a very old policy. And in this previous year, in our previous year, previous year 23, 24, this person is getting a sum. Uh, this person is getting an amount on maturity. So let's say this person is in this year, he's getting rupees 10 lakh. This is the maturity amount which he's getting. So this amount can be exempt also. It could be taxable also. So it depends upon few parameters. Generally, the date of issue of policy and how much premium we are paying. So it depends mainly on two parameters. One is the date of policy. When was by date of policy? What do I mean by date of policy? I mean, when was this policy started? When whenever he has first started this policy, that is called date of policy. So whether this amount, do you understand this amount? This is the amount which he is receiving on maturity. So this amount is taxable. If it is taxable, I have voice, correct? So whether it will be taxable, it will be exempt. It depends upon certain parameters. Generally, the parameter is the date of policy. When was this policy started? Second is the amount of premium which we used to pay on this policy. Generally, it depends upon two things, right? Okay. So my question is whether it is exempt or it is taxable. So we have to check when was this policy started. So to uh, determine whether it is exempt, whether it is taxable, 
And if it is taxable, it will be come under IFOS, right? Okay. So for first, it depends when was this policy started, date of policy. So date of policy. See, if there are certain dates which you have to remember and I, and after uh, explaining this, I'll give you a small trick also, but how I also uh, used to remember all these dates. So if the date of policy is before 1st April 2003, 2003 is the date when this everything has started at ha happening. So if this policy is before 1st April 2003, that is it's a very old policy. Uh, it was started somewhere before 1st April 2003. So for these types of policy, which is our very old policy, whatever amount which you received, whatever amount which you received on maturity, there would be no problem. It will be exempt. It will be exempt. Please don't make it taxable. Got it? Simple. So if this is a very old policy, before 1st April 2003, let's say I have a policy which I have started from uh, April 2002 or January 2003 or March 2003 before this date, then it will be exempt. If I am getting an amount in this year, which was 20 years old policy, 21 years old policy. Now, if I am getting this amount, this amount will be completely exempt. No problem. Full stop. Shut down. Got it. Okay. Let's say if the date of policy is after this date, if the date of policy is on or after 1st April 2003, but up to 31st of March 2012, if the policy was started somewhere in this period, on or after 1st April 2003, but up to 31st March 2012, then the amount, such policy amount which I received this year, it could be exempt, it could be taxable also. Now it depends upon the premium amount, how much annual premium I was paying. This Ashok was paying in fact. Okay. If this premium amount, if premium amount, this is annual premium. You understand what is life insurance premium? This is the annual premium which you pay to the insurance company. If the premium amount is up to 20% of sum assured, if it is up to 20% of the sum assured, then it will be exempt. Otherwise, it will be taxable. And if taxable, it would be taxable under IFOS. Got it? So if this policy is issued in this period, in this period, then we will check the premium amount, how much premium the assessee was paying. If the premium was up to 20% of sum assured, see, see here, I can say that sum assured was 10 lakh. So if the annual premium was up to 20%, it will be 2 lakh rupees, right? If it is 2 lakh or less, and if this amount will we we'll, uh, receive on maturity, this will be exempt. But if the annual premium was more than 2 lakh, in this case, it will be taxable. Got it? Easy. Okay. Then if this date of policy, this date of policy was after this date, after 31st March 2012. So what is the date? The date is 1st April. The date is 1st April, on or after, I mean, 1st April 2012 to 31st March 2013, if the issue date of this policy, this policy was started in this year, in 2012-13, that is, I would see, if you look, I have written only one year, 1st April 2012 to 31st March 2013, then we have to see if the premium amount, here this 20% was changed to 10%, so if the premium amount is up to 10% of sum is short. Everything is same now, but just the 20% amount that was has been reduced to 10%. If premium amount is up to 10% of sum is short, then exempt. Then only it would be exempt. If the premium amount is more than 10%, uh, it will be taxable. So I can say that if Ashok has a policy, now he's receiving sum is short of 10 lakh from this policy. And this policy was taken in this period. Let's say if this policy was started in this period, 
and if the premium amount was let's say 80,000, 90,000 or 1 lakh, see if it is 80,000, 90,000 or 1 lakh whatever, not more than 1 lakh, 1 lakh is 10% of 10 lakh is 1 lakh or less, then this 10 lakh will be exempt because this premium, the premium which we were paying were not more than 10%. But let's say the premium amount was 1 lakh 10,000. Let's say the premium amount was 1 lakh 10,000. If you calculate the premium with some assured, it will be more than 10%. So if it is more, then it will not be exempt. So this amount, when whenever we will receive, make it taxable under IFRS. Got it? Okay. And if the policy is on or after, after this date, right? So on or after 1st April 2013, then we have to see the premium amount is up to 10% for generally, for in general, for general policy 10%. But if this policy is taken for a person who is disabled, then we have to take 15% of sum assured. And this 15% we have to take if the person is disabled. This was the position before amendment, although still it is there, one more thing is added. now. If the person is disabled, then it is 15%. Okay, now this was the position earlier also. Now also it is there, but one more thing is now added to this. What was the amendment? As of now, I have not discussed the amendment, but this is the provision earlier. This is the provision as of now also. But one more thing is added to it, correct. But first, let me give you my trick how I remember these dates. Generally, I just remember this date. I have learned this date only, which I have specifically um, uh, written it over the here in white, not in yellow. So I generally uh, have learned only this date, 1st April 2012. Generally, after 1st April 2012, the scenario was changed. So I, I keep in mind, that before 1st April 2012, it is 20%. After 1st April 2012, it is 10%. Right? Although before 1st April 2003, it was exempt, but generally it is a very old policy. It's a very old policy. So I have kept this in the back of the mind. If it is a very old policy, then exempt. Right? So generally, I keep this date in mind. So before this date, if the policy was issued before this date, I take 20%. After this date, I take 10%. So from this date, income tax has made 10% for all the policies, 10% for all the policy. But in one year, they realized their mistake. This is how I have made a story in my mind. So within one year, this is actually which, which had happened, but I have also made a story in my mind. So in one year, they have realized a mistake that LIC charges more for person who are disabled because obviously LIC are they are running their own business and for the person who is uh, suffering from disease or person who is disabled the chances of dying that person is more that is the reason they charge higher policy so within a year income tax realized that person who are disabled they LIC charge higher premium so that is the reason they had, they came out with an amendment just after one year so that is how I remember this one year for, for this one year all the policy amount should be taken as 10%. But after that year, they realize their mistake. So for disabled, they say, they are saying now, for disabled, if the policy is related to disabled person, then we will take 15%. Otherwise, we will take it 10%. That's, that is how I have built a story in my mind and I, I was, I'm able to uh, recall these dates. Correct? So this is how also you can frame your own story. And this is how I keep these dates in my mind. So I have learned just this date and with this date, I just used to build up this particular story. Okay. Now the thing has changed is it has changed from this year. Now here comes the amendment. Amendment says if the policy is issued on or after, because this amendment was from this year, 2023, 2024. So it says that the policy is issued on or after. 1st April 2023. So I can say earlier it was 1st April 2013. So here is uh, I can take it till 31st March 23. This provision will apply. 
but if the policy because here now comes an amendment now now there is one one more point which is added here so if the policy is on or after 1st april 2023 we will say if the premium amount is up to 10 percent of some assured or 15 percent of some assured for person who is physically handicapped same or now they have added a monetary value also to this particular premium or rupees 5 lakh if if the premium amount is more than 5 lakh even so now we have to see 10 percent of some assured or 5 lakh whichever is lower now they have added one more amount here that to in monetary value fixed amount 5 lakh if your premium annual premium is more than 5 lakh then also we are going to tax you so whatever the amount which you receive on maturity we are going to tax you but please remember this is a prospective amendment not a retrospective amendment it says that the policy these 5 lakh please apply this 5 lakh limit only to those, those policy which are issued on or after this year 1st April 2023 got it so this is an amendment this is the amendment which is now there so earlier earlier things are still there but the policy which are now new which are issued on or after 1st April 2023 and onwards we have to see 10% of some assured or 15% of some assured as the case may be and also one more limit here is 5 lakh if the annual premium is more than 5 lakh then also we will be taxing it now, now we have to see two things whether the annual premium is more than 10% then also we will tax or 15% as the case may be then also we will tax and also if the premium amount is more than 5 lakh also then also we are going to tax it but please don't apply 5 lakh to these policies because this is a prospective amendment it will be applied only to such policies which are issued 1st April 2023 or onwards got it okay do you want to write it if you want you can write it but i have already uh, written it in your uh, book as well so everything is written over here if you want if you wish then you can write it also if you would like to wish you can pause the video here if you would like to write it down okay i'm coming back see so these all things are written over here this is old provisions so i just remember this particular date with this date i used to build the entire story okay on or after 1st april 2003 this is the amendment it says if the premium of any of the year exceeds 10 percent or 15 percent in case of disabled then also it will be taxable or if the amount of premium of any year exceeds 5 lakh then also it will be taxable in case of multiple policy i'll tell you first uh, this is a example if you would like to we will discuss some few examples also on this this is a uh, illustration number 27 from your question bank this is page 7.8 now you can also download this question bank from the website if you would like to uh, Take a screenshot right here. You can take the screenshot also, and you can also download this question back also. No, no, this, this, I'm so sorry. This is not, not in question mark. This is illustration um, book. So this will not be available because it has unsolved questions. So it will not, not be available to you. But yes, I am um, trying to upload the question mark which has solved illustration so that you can practice accordingly, right? And uh, this uh, question bank has your mtp rtps and past year questions also so this it would be very much beneficial if you practice side by side while doing your um, revision videos and as well as your uh, practice you, you can also practice from the question bank itself okay so this is uh, you can take a screenshot here guys okay done it says determine whether the exemption is available under section 1010d for a single policy purchased by four different persons so these are four different scenarios for, for different SSEs. so we have to tell whether this amount the amount which the he has received on maturity whether it is taxable or it is exempt 
So let me uh, first do with the uh, Mr. W. So date of policy is 31st of December 2022. Date of the policy is 31st December 2022. That is not uh, on or after 1st April 2023. We don't have to apply 5 lakh limit over here. We will simply apply 10% or 15% as the case may be. So if it's, uh, nothing is mentioned about disability, then we will assume 10%, right? So uh, date of the policy is 31st of December 2022. Is it 20% or 10%? It's a 10% because after 1st April 2020, uh, 2012, all policies are 10% except for physically handicapped, we have to take 15%. Okay, so 10%. Premium payable every year. How much is the premium payable? 5.6 lakh. Okay. How much is the sum assured? 60 lakh. Tell me whether this sum assured, I'm sorry, whether this premium is more than 10%? The answer is no, sir. Of 60 lakh, if we we'll calculate 10%, it is 6 lakh. So this is not more than 6 lakh. So this is not more than 10%. So we can say that this would be exempt because 5 lakh condition will not be available, uh, would not be, will not apply here. Why? Because this date of issue of this policy is not on or after 1st April 2023. So whether the amount of premium exceeds 10%, the answer is no. Premium amount does not exceed 10%. Whether the amount of premium during the year exceeds 5 lakh, that is not applicable to this policy because this policy was issued before 1st April 2023. So uh, neither it is exceeding 10%, 5 lakh limit will not be applicable. Although the premium is more than 5 lakh, but that 5 lakh limit will not be applicable, would not apply to this policy, correct? Because this policy was issued before this date. So whether exemption would be available? Yes, sir. We will exempt this amount. So whatever the amount you will receive on maturity, that will be exempt, right? Because the premium was not more than 10%. Okay, for Mr. X, date of policy is 25th of March 2023. First, this date is very important. So, is it issued after 1st April 2023 or it is before? It is before. So, 5 lakh limit will not be applicable to it. So, 5 lakh limit would not be applicable to it. Correct? So, not 5 lakh limit would not be applicable because it is issued before 1st April 2023. Okay, tell me, sum assured is 25 lakh. Premium is 3 lakh, more than 10%. Got it? 10% will apply here because this uh, is issued on 25th March 2023 after 1st April 2020, uh, 2012, right? So if this amount is more than 10%. So whether the amount of premium is more than 10%, answer is yes. Therefore, whether it will be exempt? No, sir. It will not be exempt. Whether it will be exempt? No. As the premium is more than 10%, it will not be exempt. Correct? So this amount we will receive on maturity. Please make it IFOS income. Correct? 25 lakh will become IFOS income. Why? This policy was issued on 20th of April 2023. That is on or after 1st April 2023, this policy was issued. That is this policy will come under our amendment. Okay. Whether the premium is more than 5 lakh? No, sir. Premium was not more than 5 lakh. The premium was not more than 5 lakh. Okay. The premium was not more than 5 lakh. Good. Check 10%. Okay. The sum assured is 40 lakh. Sum assured is 40 lakh. 40 lakh into 10% is 4 lakh. Whether the premium is more than 4 lakh? Yes. 4.3 lakh. Whether the premium is more than 10%? Yes. We will make it exempt or taxable? Taxable. Although it is not exceeding 5 lakh, but we have now two conditions. It can exceed 10% also or 15% as the case may be, or it can exceed 5 lakh also. 5 lakh condition was not satisfied here, but 10% of the sum assured premium or uh, 10% premium, it is exceeding that amount. That is condition is now fulfilled. So it will not be exempt. It will be taxable. Whether it is exempt? No, no, sir. It will not be exempt. We will make it taxable. So 40 lakh rupees, which you will receive on maturity, please make it IFRS income 40 lakh rupees. Got it? Okay. For Mr. Z. Date of issue of policy is 28th of February 2024. After 1st April 2023. Uh, it is after our amendment. Correct? Premium payable is 5.45 lakh. It is more than 5 lakh. The premium of any year if it is more than 5 lakh. Yes, sir. Make it taxable. Whether it will be exempt? No, it will not be exempt. Why? Premium is more than 5 lakh. Sir, is the premium is more than 10%? No need to see that because 
because now the amendment says if any of the condition is satisfied either the premium is more than 10% or 15% as the case may be or the premium is more than 5 lakh also now here the premium is more than 5 lakh although the sum assured was 65 lakh if i will calculate 10% or 65 lakh is 6.5 lakh although the premium was not more than 10% but the 5 lakh the premium is more than 5 lakh that is the reason this will not be exempt no it will not be exempt because premium is more than 5 lakh it will be taxable got it okay now there is one more point also which i would like to explain in case of more than one life insurance policy if assessee has more than one life insurance policy right okay if any of the policy has a premium of more than 5 lakh or more than 10% we will make it taxable anyhow but what if if there are multiple policy and their premium was not more than 5 lakh but in aggregate they were more than 5 lakh then what we will do is we will make it taxable we will make it taxable but here we will also apply optimization technique here i will also apply optimization technique so let me explain this with an example first of all i am going to read this in case of more than one life insurance policy if you have more than one life insurance policy then such policies are exempt where aggregate premium of any year does not exceed 5 lakh and here you have to apply optimization so what it is written over here let me explain you with an example so there is another illustration uh, i would like you to take a screenshot also of this mm -hmm, this way you can take a screenshot here. Okay. Taken? Okay. See, determine whether the exemption is available under section 1010D for multiple policies purchased after 1st April 2023 by Suresh in the following scenario. Here the assess is Suresh and he has multiple policies. Policy 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. He has 7 policies and these all policies are taken on or after 1st April 2023. That is they are under amendment. Okay. Okay. Premium payable every year. Premium pay pay payable every year for policy 1, 6 lakh. No doubt make it taxable. Why? Sir, premium is more than 5 lakh. We will make it taxable. So what will make it taxable? 50 lakh rupees. Sum assured which you will receive it will be taxable whether it is exempt no sir it will not be exempt why the premium is more than 5 lakh so it will be taxable correct because the premium is more than 5 lakh policy number 2 premium is 2.2 lakh not more than 5 lakh let's check 10 percent uh the sum assured is 18 lakh so 18 lakh 10 percent is 1.8 lakh premium is more than 10 percent in that way, second, uh, my, my, one of the condition is getting satisfied. The premium is more than 10% or 15% as the case may be. If it is not given anything about uh, disability, then we will take it 10%. So the premium is more than 10%. That is the reason it will, will it be exempt? No, it will not be exempt. Why? Premium is more than 10%. That is the reason we will make it tax. Policy 1 will be taxable. Policy 2 will be taxable, no doubt. Let me see policy number 3. Policy number three has a premium of 0.7 lakh, that is 70,000 rupees. Okay. And the sum assured is 4 lakh, more than 10%. Why? 4 lakh 10% is 40,000 and you are paying 70,000. This 4 lakh also will be taxable. Will it be exempt? The answer is no, it will not be exempt. Why? Because the premium is more than 10%. Any of the condition, whether the premium is more than 10% or the premium is more than 5 lakh, we will make it taxable. Policy. I can write it here that policy 1 would be taxable, policy 2 would be taxable, policy 3 would be taxable. Okay. Policy number 4. The policy amount is 1.1 lakh. Sir, not more than 5 lakh. Okay. And the sum assured is 12 lakh. 12 lakh into 10% is 1.2 lakh. The premium is also not exceeding 10%. Okay. So this could be exempt. This could be exempt, right? Neither the premium is more than 5 lakh nor the premium is more than 10% of the sum short. Let me check for policy number 5. Premium is not more than 5 lakh, 80,000. 10 lakh is the sum short. 10 lakh, 10% 10 is 1 lakh. Premium is also not more than 10%. 
exempt. Policy six, 1.2 lakh, less than 5 lakh. Sum assured is 15 lakh, 15 lakh is 1.5. It is less than that, also it will be exempt. Policy seven, 2 lakh, less than 5 lakh. 25 lakh is the sum assured, 2.5, less than that, it will be exempt. Okay, so there is no doubt about these three policies. These three policies would be taxable. But what about these four, five, six, and seven? These are multiple policies where the uh, annual premium is not more than five lakh. But here, what we will see is we will exempt those policies where the aggregate is not more than five lakh. But if we'll aggregate the premium, if we'll aggregate the premium, tell me if I'll add all these things. Uh, where is my calculator? Give me a moment, guys. Okay. I'm so sorry. So please add these policies. Uh, 1.1, 1 .1, 0 0.8, 1 0.2, 2 lakh. 1.1 plus 0.8 plus 1.2 plus 2. This is 5.1. See, if I'll do the aggregate, it is coming 5.1 lakh, which is more than 5 lakh. So should I make all these four policies taxable? No. Now I will follow. I will exempt those policies where the aggregate is not more than 5 lakh. I'll exempt those policies where the aggregate. So if I'll do the aggregate of all four, it is more than 5 lakh. So I cannot exempt all four. I cannot exempt all four. But yes, I can, I think I can exempt three policies. Why? If I see a four, five and six, let, let me take the aggregate of four, five, six. It is 1.1 1 .1 plus 0.8 plus 1.2. It is coming 3.1 lakh. I can exempt these three. Why? Because the policy aggregate of the policy premium amount is not more than 5 lakh. But if I will aggregate four of them, it is more than five. I cannot exempt four, all four, but I can exempt three. So I can exempt these three policies, four, five and six, and I can make it seven taxable. Or what I can do is I can exempt five, six or seven. Let me aggregate this 0 0.8 plus 1.2 plus two. It is coming 4 lakh. Yes, I can exempt these also because the aggregate is not more than 5 lakh. But if I, I'll add all 4, it will become more than 5 lakh. I cannot exempt 4, but I can exempt 3. So either I can exempt 4, 5, 6. I can exempt 5, 6, 7. Okay. Let me exempt 4, 5 and 7. Can I exempt that? Only 4, 5 and 7. 4 is 1.1. So policy number 5 is 0.8 plus 2. Yes, it is coming 3.9. So I have another option where I can exempt 4, 6 and 7. So what I'll do, I'll apply optimization technique over here. What is optimization? Please tax only that policy, tax only that policy, which is more, most favorable to the SSE, most favorable to the SSE. So here, what I have to see is first I'll exempt fourth policy. I'll check how much is, uh, sorry, first I'll tax fourth policy and I'll take this much, how much tax I have to pay. Then I'll exempt one by one. I'll check with fifth policy. I'll exempt 1.1, 1.2, 1 2 lakh. I'll exempt fourth, sixth and seventh. Then I'll uh, exempt sixth policy. I'll take this amount. Then I'll, uh, I'll be make it taxable. You, you are getting it. I'll, what I'll do is I'll keep on checking that which option is giving me the best scenario. So what I'll do is, see, option is first, let's make policy number seven taxable. If I'll make policy number seven taxable, I have an option of exempting four, five and six. If I'll take policy number six taxable, then I'll be able to exempt four, five and seven, four, five and seven. If I'm going to take policy number four as exempt or sorry, four as taxable, then I can exempt policy number five, six and seven. If I am going to tax policy number five, then I can exempt four, six and seven. Okay, got it. So if I make policy seven taxable and what is the total amount of policy four, five and six, it is not more than five lakh. Okay, I can exempt these three policy and I can make it taxable. If I exempt policy number six taxable, 
then four five sorry for policy number six taxable then four five six can be exempted total premium is 3.9 lakh or i have this option also policy number four taxable then five six seven exempt total is four lakh i have this option also policy number five taxable for four six and seven total is 4.3 i have this option also which option is the best for me which is option is best for the assessee check the taxable amount see if you will tax policy number seven if you will tax policy number seven so policy seven has a maturity value of 25 lakh 25 lakh will become taxable if you will tax policy number six policy number six has a maturity of 15 lakh 15 lakh will become taxable policy number four 12 lakh will be taxable policy number five 10 lakh would be taxable what is the best scenario sir best scenario is 10 lakh only i have to pay least tax in this scenario because 25 lakh is the worst uh, scenario why this is the worst option because here i have to pay tax on 25 lakh but here i have to pay tax on 10 lakh so in this case i will choose this particular option where i am going to tax policy number five and i'm going to exempt policy number four six and seven because aggregate of four six seven is not more than five got it so this is how you will be able to do this question you can take a screenshot here also if you wish you can take the screenshot here as well or okay this is the perfect screenshot you are getting both uh, your um, question as well as your solution here see coming back so this was written over here in case of more than one life insurance policy other than ulip for ulip this uh, provision will not apply and ulip is also not in our course for ulip tax taxability we have there is another section in capital gain 451 b which is not in our course we will see it in ca final so in case of more than one life insurance policy then such policies are exempt where aggregate premium of any year does not exceed 5 lakh so we have seen the aggregate premium was not exceeding 5 lakh and we have made only one policy taxable in our case it was policy 5 i believe right apply optimization and now you know how to apply optimization also now the question is how much amount is taxable from such insurance policy this is also important how much amount is taxable we understand the amount which we receives on maturity becomes taxable the amount which we receives on maturity and what amount we receive on maturity some is short plus sometimes bonus also this life insurance policy, the business of life insurance policy is such that, that they give an option to the assessee, to the, that person who has taken the policy to their customer. They say that if you pay your premium, all your premium on time, if you pay your premium timely, then we will give you extra bonus on maturity. So whatever the amount which you receive on maturity, some assured, obviously you will receive, plus you might receive bonus also. So whatever the amount which you receive at the time of maturity, it will be taxable. Plus, you can also deduct the amount because this is the amount which you have received on maturity, it is taxable. But you have also paid premium, right? You have also paid premium on the life of this policy. You are, you are paying premium. So can you subtract the premium amount? The answer is yes, you can subtract that also. So the amount which you have received on maturity, that is your income. But you are paying premium also. So that premium should be allowed as deduction from this amount right because that was your expenses which you are happening so you can deduct those expenses also the sum which you are paid as premium you can deduct provided you must not have claimed any deductions on such premium if you have claimed any deduction earlier then we are not going to deduct it further right so you can subtract only those premium you can subtract only those premium where deduction was not taken earlier so generally we take deductions under ATC that that is the reason I was saying that the sum assured will become taxable plus if you have received bonus also it will become taxable but yes you can deduct premium amount also provided no deduction has been claimed in any earlier previous years correct so it says so whatever the sum amount which you have received on maturity including bonus will become your income. Can you deduct the premium paid during the tenure of such policy which you are paying premium? Can you deduct that premium also? The answer is yes and the answer can also be no. How? So if only such premium is allowed to be deducted, only you can deduct that premium where you have not taken any dedu deduction in any earlier year. Because if you have taken deduction also earlier 
and now also if you are deducting so it will amount to double deduction we are not going to give you i'm so sorry we are not going to give you double benefits so in this case only such premium is allowed to be deducted which is not claimed as reduction in earlier uh, previous years under any provisions of this income tax act correct okay so this was about life insurance policy some few more points are there amount received on death of the person is always exempt see uh, i have said to you that there is an amendment now that if the premium was more than 10% or if the premium is more than 5 lakh then it will be taxable right but if this amount was getting received on the death of the person who is insured then it will not be taxable right so this is an exception over here if this amount is received on maturity then it can be taxable but if this person has died and then this person's family is getting this amount then it will not be taxable but here also uh, we will do this in uh, deductions revisions that there is um, a section 80 double d disabled dependent where um, the assessee can also take insurance on that person who is fully dependent on him and who is disabled also and in that, that case, if he has taken any policy for him, he's paying premium. And in that case, if this disabled person dies, if this disabled person dies and the person who has taken this policy, he receives any amount in that case, then it becomes taxable. Then it becomes taxable, right? So this I'll discuss with you under section 80 double D in uh, that deduction chapter also. So general saying is that if this amount is received on death of the person who is insured, in that case, it is exempt. But again, it has one more exception to that. However, policy taken for the benefit of the disabled person, which is covered under section 80 double D, that we will see in 80 double D. So that uh, this point I'll also, um, it's also mentioned in 80 double D, that if that person dies, that disabled person dies, and the person who has taken this policy receives any amount, then it becomes taxable. The scheme and insurance policy, you understand whenever you receive amount under scheme and insurance policy, it becomes taxable. If it is, uh, this amount is received by the employee, it becomes their salary income. If they are received by the employer, the business, and it becomes their PGBP income, we have seen in PGBP also. And if the scheme and insurance policy is given to other person or to the family of that person, of the employee, it becomes their IFOS income, that we know. Taxability of ULEP is governed under section 45.1b. That is not in our syllabus. That we'll see in CA final level. I've written it also over there. Okay, so this was about section 56.2. And I have already also written some of the things here which are taxable under IFOS if they are not taxable under other heads. They can also come under IFOS also. So if do you remember this point we have discussed in PGBP under section 36. What this point tells us, see. Uh, when I was uh, discussing section 36, that is other deductions. Do you remember that section? That is other deductions, which, uh, uh, which I was di uh, discussing with you in PGBP chapter. Employer contribution to provident fund is allowed if it is deposited up to the due date of ROI. But what about employee contribution? I have also uh, discussed this with you that if there is an employer, let's say it's a company, company, uh, there's a company and they first deduct employee contribution to provident fund, superannuation fund or any other welfare funds, they first deduct from employee salary, right? And then they deposit it to that respective fund, whatever the type of fund is, they are going to deposit that also. So they should deposit that amount up to the due date of ROI or this is employee contribution, right? This is not employer contribution. This is employees contribution. So whenever we deduct, we let's say we I'm a company, I'm deducting, there are so many employees who are working for me. The, the company, while giving salary to the employee, they deduct some amount from their salary that we call employee contribution, remember? So we deduct employee contribution and we should deposit this amount. We should deposit this amount to the uh, respective provident fund or other fund up to the due date of that respective act. So if it is provident fund, we should deposit it within 15 days, right? From the end of this that month, we should deposit. We have only 15 days, we should deposit that. Otherwise, it will become our income. So it will become your PGBP income. And if it is not taxed under PGBP, it should be taxed under IFOS. So IFOS has made it very clear that although it is PGBP income, it should be taxed under PGBP. But if it is not taxed under PGBP, then it will become your IFOS income. 
So what see the heading? It says that the following income are taxable under IFRS if not charged under PGP. If not charged under PGP, although they are primarily PGPP income, but if it is not charged under PGPP, then we will make it IFRS. So employee contribution to provident fund, superannuation fund, other welfare fund received from employer if not charged to PGPP. However, you will get a deduction if uh, first, whenever you will deduct, it will become your income. But if you deposit it within 15 days, let's say it is PF within 15 days, if you deposit, then you can claim a deduction that is written under section 57 also. But if you don't uh, pay it up to, uh, let's say if it is PF up to 15th day of next month, then it will always become your income, right? It was there in PGBP and the same thing is written in IFS also. Okay. Renting of, let's say if you have, uh, if you have your machine or any other furniture, if you rent it to someone, so it will become your IFRS income. But yes, if you are into such business of renting of that machine, renting of that furniture, then it will become your PGVP. But if it, if you are not into the such business, then it will become your IFRS income. And also, do you remember, uh, I have discussed with you in the chapter of house property, the concept of composite rent, right? Where you let out your building with other facilities, with other furniture, with other services, also you let this. So will it become your house property income or other head income? So it depends whether letting of building or letting of other assets are separable or not. This is what we have discussed in composite rent, right? So the test is whether this can be given on rent, whether they are separable or not, whether we can give them a rent separately also, or whether if it, if it will be given on rent, it will be altogether uh, be uh, given on rent. So if it is not separable, if it is separable, then whatever, if, if it is separable, right, it can be uh, given on rent individually separately. In that case, whatever the amount which you are receiving from building, it will be computed in your house property income. And for other services or other assets, it will be computed in IFOS. Yes, if you are into such business of letting these other services or other assets, if you are into such business, then it will become your PGPP. Otherwise, it will become your IFS. Remember, guys? Okay. If letting of building and letting of other things are not separable, if they are not separable, then it will become your IFS income. It will not go under P under house property. It will go under IFS. But yes, if you are into such business of letting of those other assets, if you are into such business, the entire income will be PGPP. The entire income will be PGPP. Otherwise, if you are not into such kind of business, the entire income will be IFS, not house property. This I have already discussed in composite rent under house property and now also I have discussed it. Right? Got it? So the test is whether they are separable or not separable. Interest income. Generally, interest income is debenture interest, bonds interest or bank interest if the interest becomes your IFS income. But yes, if you are into such business, money lending business, if you are into money uh, uh, lending business, of course, it will become your PGBP. But if you are not into such business, it will become your IFS income. So key points regarding interest income, you understand? Interest income is charged under IFS if you, it is not in the nature of PGBP. If you are into money lending business, then it will be your PGBP income. Second thing which you should know, if you have a post office saving account. If you have a, a saving account in post office, then whatever in, interest income which you will get, that will become your IFS income. But yes, there is a deduction which is available over here. 3500 rupees is the deduction which is available. But if this post office is a joint account, then 7000 deduction is available. So you should know about this also. So if you have a income from post office, let's say 20,000 rupees is the income which you have received, please deduct 3500 and only 16,500 will become your IFOS income, correct? If it is a joint account, then you can deduct 7,000 rupees. Then in that case, 13,000 would be your income, right? And yes, if the person is following that, I'll discuss in uh, chapter 6, say deductions also. If the person is following optional tax regime, then there is a deduction of ATTT, ATTB and all that I'll discuss with you in chapter 6. Say. But yes, this ATTT, ATTB is not available in default regime. That we'll discuss in deduction. Okay. Got it? C point. Interest on following bonds are exempt. So generally, if you are earning interest on bonds, please make it taxable. But yes, there are certain bonds where income is exempt. Which kind of bond? Generally, these are issued by government. Bonds issued by local authority, if they are 
बॉन्ड्स विच आर इशूड बाई लोकल अथॉरिटी बॉन्ड्स इशूड बाई स्टेट पुल्ड फाइनेंस एंटिटी और गोल्ड डिपॉजिट बॉन्ड नाइनटीन नाइन नाइन डिपॉजिट सर्टिफिकेट इशूड अंडर गोल्ड मॉनिटाइजेशन स्कीम टू थाउजेंड फिफ्टीन so just uh, read these things to twice or thrice so these bonds interest if you are getting interest of these bonds i am again repeating local authority bonds state pool finance entity gold deposit bonds and nine or gold gold monetization schemes if you receive interest from such kind of bonds it is exempt right interest on non resident external account nre account not so important not very important but yes it was once asked in the exam also that is the reason i have mentioned here as well so if you receive interest on non resident external account they are commonly known as nre nre speak with me non resident external account these are uh, the account which are which can be opened in banks indian banks can open these account sbi pnb they can open this account and these are accounts are open for mainly non residents they are opened by non residents so no uh, non resident can deposit some amount in these uh, accounts so uh, they have to take rbi permission and all so permission must be person must be resident outside india it is for non resident as per fema and permitted by rbi to maintain such account so if a non resident is earning interest income on such account please remember if this person is earning interest income on nre account so this uh, interest is also exempt this income is also exempt. got it not very important but please keep it at the back of your mind okay there is a concept which is known as bond washing transactions this i believe that you must know what is bond washing transactions uh, because some people most of the people would like to evade their taxes they don't want to pay the taxes so what they does is let's say a person is holding some bonds or debentures and he is about to receive interest on it he is about to receive within one week within two weeks or so he is about to receive interest on it so what he used to do is he used to transfer this bonds or debentures temporary to some other person for the time being for the time being temporary he used to transfer it for the time being and once the interest is declared by the company then after the interest is declared the interest is received he used to take it back so this is called bond washing transaction so if someone uh, assessing assessing officer found that someone is indulging into this, such kind of practice then also he'll make it taxable in the person Sand who has transferred, who is trying to evade his taxes. So this is known as bond washing transactions, right? Okay. Other IFRS income also income from this is important subletting. You understand what is subletting? So if we, there is income from subletting, or you are not the owner. Let's say I have taken someone's property on rent, and I subsequently let it to some other person. So the income which I will receive due to this arrangement that is called subletting that will be your i of s income why it will not be house property because i am not the owner the person who is owner if he is getting rent then it will become his house property but in this case if i am not the owner then this would be my income subletting income house property income mp mlas salary received by mp and mla is it salary income no because who pays them salary government and government is not the employer they are not government servant right so salary of mp and M M mlas etc it is taxable under i of s however if this person is following optional tax regime if this person is following optional tax regime then the daily allowance constituency allowance are also exempt for them otherwise if the person is following default tax regime that is new tax regime these are taxable daily allowance constituency allowance are exempt under old scheme but they are taxable under default scheme family pension you understand if a person if the employee ex employee receives pension salary but if their family receives pension it is exempt it is oh, sorry it is uh, not not exempt it is uh, ifos income yes but de there is a deduction which is available from that how much it is one third of such family pension or 15000 rupees whichever is lower now there is an amendment here as well i'll tell you uh, later also there is an amendment here as well initially previously there uh, this deduction was only allowed under optional scheme but now it is under both the scheme now family pension deduction of 1/3 of pension of 15000 is uh, applicable is available in both the regimes right whether the assessor is following new regime also default regime also that deduction is available i'll tell you in section 57 agriculture income sir agriculture income is exempt if it is from india if agriculture income is from india then it is exempt if uh agriculture income is coming from pakistan it is coming from nepal it is coming from sri lanka australia us any part of the globe other than india 
it is taxable under IFRS. Please, agricultural income from India is exempt, but if it is outside India, IFRS income. Director fees, setting fees, you understand, it is IFRS income. If director is getting salary, as a salary, if he is getting, he is working full time, then it will become their salary income. Otherwise, uh, for other directors, for uh, non executive directors, part time directors, director's remuneration is taxable under IFRS. Okay. Now there is section 57, section 56 over. Majorly, uh, our 80 percent of the chapter is over. That is section 56. Now there are some small sections 57, 58, and 59. We have to discuss that as well. So 57 is deductions which are allowed from IFOS. So what kind of deductions are allowed? Very important. Please mark it very important. This is something which is very important. You understand if I receive dividend income, if I receive dividend income or income from mutual fund, that is also known as dividend. So if I receive dividend income or income from mutual fund, that is taxable under the in the hands of shareholder. So now shareholder has to pay tax on dividend income. Can they claim any deduction from that dividend income? Generally, no. Generally, no. Examiner will confuse you. Examiner will give you such an MCQ that person is earning a dividend income of 1 lakh and there is a bank collection charges of 5,000 rupees. Can he claim deduction? No. No collection charges. Nothing. No reduction is available from dividend income. Dividend income is taxable. But yes, only one deduction can be claimed. That is, if he has purchased these shares on which he is earning dividend, if he has purchased these shares by taking a loan, and the interest which he is paying, that interest he can claim as a deduction. But yes, there is a limit to it, 20% of dividend. He cannot take this. He cannot say that, sir, I am getting, a, let's say, examiner will ask you, person is getting dividend of 1 lakh and he has taken a loan of, uh, and he has taken a loan for which he is paying interest of 90,000. So either can, and then 90,000 can be subtracted and 10,000 will be the income? No. If the interest is 90,000, we can restrict this to 20% of this dividend income. So you can claim maximum 20,000. If interest is less than 20,000, it's okay. Then we can allow that interest. But if the interest is more than 20,000 here in this case, then we can take maximum 20%. So please, this is, please mark it very important. This is, this is although not an amendment, but this is something which is very important. No expenses allowed from such dividend. Only interest expense can be allowed only up to 20% of such income. Which income? This dividend income which you are receiving. Okay. If you have given plant, machinery, furniture on rent, then you can claim such expenses like repairs, insurance, normal depreciation. You can claim from this. Interest on enhanced companies. You know there is a flat deduction of 50%. You understand? This is also important. Market important. Employee contribution. Can you claim deduction? Yes. If you have paid the amount up to the due date of that particular respective act of PF Act, if you have paid the amount, then you can claim deduction. Otherwise, if you have not paid up to that due date, that entire employee contribution will become your income. I have just discussed. Family pension, amendment over here. Both the regimes, now this deduction is available in both the regimes. One third of such pension or 15,000 rupees, whichever is lower. This exemption is now in both the regimes. Please remember this. This also now examiner can ask you that he will say that a uh, person is following default tax regime and uh, he's, he got uh, a family pension then can you claim deduction yes please give them uh, them a deduction one third of such pension or 15,000 whichever is lower right and few points regarding family pension also these are old points there is no amendment but yes you must know these uh, the member of armed forces or including paramilitary military forces if uh, uh, there is a death of the soldier on operational duty then the, whatever the family pension the family is receiving that is exempt or if the person is uh, a receiver of paramvir chakra mahavir chakra gallantry awards then also it becomes exempt right okay now there is section 58 deductions not allowed and you will see uh one, okay let me read it and you will find that i am reading pgbp provisions Section 58 says what type of deductions are not allowed. If it is a personal expense of the SSE, not allowed, obviously. Any amount of salary paid outside India without TDS, okay, not allowed. Any amount, any amount paid outside India, any interest paid, royalty fees paid, fees for technical services paid, any other amount which is taxable in India. If you are paying it outside, deduct TDS. If you are paying salary outside, deduct TDS. Otherwise, 100% will, uh, will be disallowed. If you are paying within India, if you are paying within India on which TDS provisions are applicable, 
then third, if you have not deducted TDS or not deposited the TDS up to the due date of our ROI, 30% of that amount will be disallowed. Same thing which we have done in PGBP, everything is written same. That, that is the reason I used to call IFOS mini PGBP. Okay, amount on which TDS is required to be deducted and either not deducted or TDS not deposited up to the due date of ROI, 30% of such expense. So if you are paying within India, 30%. If you are paying outside India, 100% will be disallowed. Payment made to related party in excess of fair market value to, to the extent of such excess will be disallowed. Entire amount will be disallowed or to the extent of such excess, such extent that excess amount will be disallowed, right? But cash payment, single day, single party, entire amount will be disallowed if it is more than 10,000. Let's say if you have paid 11,000, entire 11,000 will be disallowed. Okay, casual income. If you have incurred any expense on your casual income, let's say a person has won a lottery of rupees 1 lakh. He, say, he says, sir, okay, you are making 1 lakh rupees taxable. Sir, I have purchased a ticket, the lottery ticket of 1,000. Can I claim this deduction? No. From casual income, no deduction can be claimed. Even if he has incurred some expenses, no, it is not allowed. So from casual income, you cannot claim any deduction. Chapter 6 a deduction is not available. There is a flat rate of tax that is 30% uh, on such income. And uh, even if there is there's unexhausted basic exemption limit, you cannot recover it from such type, kind of income. Understand? So casual income is fully taxable. Okay, if a person is into such kind of business, what business? He's in the business of organizing race horses. He is in the uh, business of race horse establishment. So is it a casual income? No, he's into such kind of, although it is taxable under IFOS, but it is not casual. So can he claim expenses? Yes, because that is in the nature of business. So horse race establishment is a business, is a kind of business. So in that case, expenses can be claimed because that is not a casual income. Right. So last section is section 59. I have to discuss something more. But uh, here the last section is 59. 59 says deemed IFS. So it is similar to section 41 of PGBP. It says that if there is any expense, if there was any expense which we, we have claimed earlier, in any earlier year we have claimed any expense. Now that expense is getting recovered. It is same like bed debts are getting recovered, right? So if there was any expense which was claimed earlier, now we are recovering such expense, it will become our IFOS income. Why? Because we have claimed a deduction in any earlier year under IFOS. We have claimed a deduction under IFOS. Now we are recovering this amount. If we are recovering this amount, it will become our IFOS income. Getting it? Okay. Some other things which I have to discuss. First is tax rate on income from other sources. We understand IFOS is generally taxable at normal rate. IFOS income is generally taxable at normal rate. Please understand. Again, I'm repeating. If you have dividend income, if you have interest income, if you have rent from plant and machinery, if you have uh, in amount received on LIC maturity, it is taxable under normal rates. But if this income is in the nature of casual income or online gaming, online gaming is inserted this time or online gaming or it is uh, due to unexplained cash credit unexplained investment unexplained expenditure then it is on not on no normal income so then it is 30 percent and in case of unexplained income and explained credit it is 60 percent right so generally ifos is taxable at normal rates but if this ifos in the nature of casual income like winning from lotteries crossword puzzle game show card games etc then 30 percent no need to remember the section number, but the section number is 115B, double B, sorry, 115BB. Here the income is taxable at 30%. One more section which is inserted, 115BB, BBJ. You should know the provision and these are very simple provisions. Uh, section number, if you will be uh, able to not remember, that's completely fine, but you should know the provisions. So there is a new section which is inserted by this Finance Act 115BBJ. It says, net winning from online games net winning from online games so if you earn income from online gaming then also 30 percent is taxable and it says net winning what is this net winning okay i'll tell you but let me read this also bbe it says unexplained cash credit money expenditure etc you understand the rate is 60 percent plus surcharge plus this so effectively this income this income is taxable at 78 percent this income and explain cash credit and explain money do you remember we have done in, in pgbp also we used to do and in uh if you look at uh i think in your 
study material in basic concepts in chapter one. It is mentioned unexplained income, un unexplained cash credit, unexplained investment, unexplained expenditure. These all are income which is taxable at 60% late rate plus surcharge plus this. So effective it is 78%. But right now the important thing is this net winning from online games. Let me explain this to you, uh, this to you as well. Let's say, and this is something which is very easy. You'll be able to understand in a single go. Let's say uh, there is an online gaming app. Let's say there is Dream uh, 11, right? So there is an app called Dream 11. And you download this app in your phone and you start it. This is just for example, please don't do this. Uh, so it is a sort of gambling. Okay. So no one, no one, uh, if the chances of winning are very, very less, right? So it is a kind of gambling. It is just sort of example, say. So let's say you download an, an app Dream 11 and uh, you uh, start playing this uh, game and you load your wallet. You load your wallet. The, there is a wallet. You deposit amount, let's say rupees 10,000 in this wallet. So 10,000 is your income? No. So this is the amount which we have deposited. 10,000 you deposit. And let's say you play it for a day or for a one week or one month. And after one month, now your balance of wallet is, now your balance of wallet is, let's say rupees 1 lakh. And you withdraw this amount, this entire 1 lakh. Tell me how much is the net winning? How much is the net winning? And then you withdraw the amount and then you, uh, Uninstall this app also from your mobile. When you uninstall it, you say, I'm not going to play. But tell me, have you won anything? The answer is yes, sir. We won 1 lakh minus 10,000. That is 1 lakh which you have withdrawn. 1 lakh which you have withdrawn minus the amount which you have deposited. Minus the amount which you have deposited 10,000. So 90,000 is the net winning. So on this 90,000, we are going to text. 30%. So this is one so the new section which is inserted, which says this is the amount which is the net winning, right? Some people can also do this in the an, another fashion. Let's say there is a person who started his wallet, he deposit rupees 10,000. He deposit rupees 10,000 and entire year he plays, entire year he, he plays and the closing balance, the closing balance of the wallet comes to at the end of the year, let's say on 31st of March 2024, closing balance comes to rupees 1,50,000. So tell me, he does not withdraw anything. He does not withdraw anything. He deposit 10,000 rupees and he keeps on playing and the closing balance of the wallet becomes 1,50,000. So in this case also, whatever is your closing balance, whatever is your closing balance minus the amount was there in your opening balance minus your deposit amount will become your net winning. So in this case, you have not withdrawn anything, but still this section says that this is considered as your net winning. So closing balance is 1,50,000. Let's say opening balance was zero because on 1st April, you don't have this app in your uh, mobile phone. You have downloaded it during the year and deposit was how much? 10,000. So in this case, 1,40,000 would be taxable. 1,40,000 would be taxable even if you have not withdrawn. But yes, the closing balance will be now taxable. The net winning minus the amount of opening balance minus the amount of uh, deposit. Okay. Let me. So this is very logical. You don't have to learn anything. Let's say next year. I'm continuing with the same example. Let's say next year. What is the opening balance? Opening balance is 1,50,000. Okay. And let's say in this year also, this person plays and now the closing balance comes to 1,80,000 and he does not withdraw anything from here. Still amount would be taxable. How much? 30,000 he has earned. So whatever is the closing balance minus opening minus deposit. So closing balance is 1,80,000 minus opening is uh, 150. Minus deposit, he does not deposit anything. So this is now 30,000 is the amount of net winning for the second year. Third year, let's say third year, I'm continuing with this example. How much is the opening balance? Sir, 180. The closing balance of last year becomes the opening balance of this year. 
so the opening balance is 180 let's say and during the year he withdraw rupees 2 lakh 10000 rupees he withdraw 2 lakh 10000 how come he earns 30000 more and now he is withdrawing everything and the closing balance is now zero closing balance is now zero so whatever he has withdrawn also that will also become his income so whatever he has withdrawn also that will also become an income because there was no closing balance withdrawn minus opening balance minus deposit so two lakh ten thousand minus opening balance was 180 deposit was nothing so thirty thousand will be taxable here also this was a net winning so if we would i have given you a scenario so if i would like to construct a formula for this i would like to construct a formula for this i'll simply say sir whatever is the closing balance that also becomes your income and if you withdraw also that also becomes your income and from it you have to subtract whatever is your opening balance and whatever amount you have deposited subtract that so this is your nothing but this is your net winning right so this is a simple example a formula which you can make whatever is the closing balance plus whatever you withdraw it becomes your income minus whatever is your you have subtracted these two things what you have subtracted opening balance and deposit whatever you deposit that is not your income whatever is the opening balance that is not the income because that was already taxed earlier year. correct so this is a simple formula which you can build yourself this is what this section has given us to us so, so this formula do you have to learn this formula no need why just apply your logic and you will be able to build this formula yourself although it is uh, given by this uh, section that net winning would, would be net winning would be a plus t minus b plus c why are you into this a b c d you know what is a what would be a the amount of closing balance d would be the amount of deposit uh, amount of withdrawn minus b opening balance c would be your uh, the amount which you have deposited right so this is if you look at it also a is the amount withdrawn d is the closing balance right the amount which you have withdrawn is, is your income closing balance is your income so what is not your income opening balance is not your income the b is the deposit which you have made deposit which you have made c is the opening balance is not your income so don't uh, learn this a plus d minus b plus c please learn it in this manner in learn it in this manner closing balance plus withdraw minus opening balance plus deposit if you would like to write it down please write it got it Okay, I'm changing it. Some of the exempt income, you understand if a person receives anything uh, due to natural disaster, if there's any earthquake, cyclone, etc. If something is received, then it is not taxable. Educational scholarship, if a student receives educational scholarship from any person, from any person, that is also exempt. Your awards, literally scientific or artistic work, work awards by government are also exempt and commuted pension okay national disaster education scholarship awards are exempt commuted pension see some people uh, they do is uh, to uh, protect their uh, retire uh, to protect their retirement what they do is they take a pension policy from lic they take a pension policy from lic they when uh, uh, when they are of young age they used to pay uh, annual premium to lic once they reach a retirement age let's say 60 or 65 once they retire now lic used to give them back the amount it could be monthly amount it could be lump sum amount if it is monthly amount which is given by lic it becomes taxable it is uncommuted but if it is a lump sum amount which lic or other insurance company gives to us from such pension one if it is a lump sum amount then it is exempt so it is written over here commuted pension if any commuted pension that is lump sum amount received by an individual from a fund set up by LIC of India if you have taken any LIC policy and if you if they give you regular amount monthly taxable but if they give you a lump sum amount that is exempt correct so this was IFOS should I discuss this deemed dividend also or do you know deemed dividend I should discuss this okay, okay. I'll take some time I'll discuss this also taxability of dividend you understand that dividend are taxable under IFOS and I have also already mentioned under section 56 it was written that if this dividend is in the nature of deemed dividend also then also it is taxable okay we understand that uh, these are normal dividends final dividend and interim dividend what is the charge chargeability final dividend is taxable 
whenever the dividend is declared. So whenever the company declares a, so this is normal dividend. This is normal dividend, which we call final dividend, which is which happens during AGM, right? So whenever the company declares final dividend, it becomes taxable. Whenever they have declared, when you receive it or whenever it was declared, even if it is declared, whenever the final dividend is declared, it becomes taxable, right? Even if we have not received it. So final dividend is taxable on the basis on which it is declared by the company. If it is interim dividend during the year, if you receive any dividend, that is interim dividend. So it becomes taxable once you receive it. Once you receive it, it becomes taxable. So interim dividend chargeability is that when we receive it, or we can say whenever it is made unconditionally available to the member. Member here means shareholder. So whenever we give it to the shareholder, interim dividend is taxable at that particular point of time. So good, good enough. Final dividend is taxable as and when it is declared. Interim dividend is taxable as and when it is received by the shareholder. Deemed dividend. Deemed dividend are covered under section 222A, B, C, D and E. Deemed dividend under section 222A, B, C and D. These four will be taxable whenever they are distributed. What are 222A, B, C, D and E? I'll be discussing it right now. And 222A dividend is taxable at the time of payment. Whenever the company pays you, then 222A is taxable. What is 222A? Let us discuss these points. So, you know, understand that deemed dividend is also kind of dividend. So, it will be taxable in the hands of shareholder. Shareholder is going to pay tax on it. 222A, 222B, C and D. They are not that important. 222E is much more important. But still, let us discuss each and every uh, part, part of it. So, 222A says, 222A says that whenever a company declares dividend, whenever a company declares dividend, they don't declare it uh, directly. What they do is they distribute their assets. They distribute their assets to the shareholder. Without declaring dividend, they are distributing their assets to the shareholder. So that will also be considered as team dividend to the extent of accumulated profit. To the extent of accumulated profit, if the company distributes their assets to the shareholder, then also we will say that it is not actual dividend, but it will also be assumed to be a dividend. So whenever company distributes their assets to the shareholder, that shareholder could be equity shareholder, it could be preference shareholders, but please remember to the extent of accumulated profits, then it will become your deemed dividend under section 222. 222BC says that if any company issues, if any companies issues debentures or debenture certificates to the shareholder, to equity or to preference shareholders, if they issue such kinds of debentures without any consideration, they are issuing it. So why they are giving them debentures without consideration? It is a kind of dividend which they are paying. So if we have, if the company has accumulated profits, if the company has accumulated profits and they are issuing debentures, debenture certificates, etc., to the shareholders, then also it will become, it will be assumed that they are giving dividend to the shareholders. It will be taxable in the hands of shareholder if the company has accumulated profit to the extent of accumulated profits, right? And if their company is issuing bonus shares. Can bonus share can also be come into uh, can come in this point? The answer is yes. If the bonus shares are given to preference shareholder, please remember this that a bonus share because bonus shares are something which are given to equity shareholders. So if bonus shares are given to preference shareholders, then also will make it taxable as deemed dividend. But remember to the extent of accumulated profits. 222C I have recently discussed with you in my last lecture of capital gain. I have discussed with you that whenever the company is getting liquidated, whenever the company is getting liquidated and the company is giving their assets to the shareholder, so it will become deemed dividend to the extent of accumulated profit. So at the time of liquidation, if the company is distributing assets to the shareholder, you will consider this as a deemed dividend, but to the extent of accumulated profits. Are you able to recall these points? 222D is these are the uh, 222 is whenever the company reduces their share capital. Generally, company reduces their share, share capital if they are in a loss. But here, company are reducing share capital. Why? Because they would like to give some funds to the shareholders. And how they are doing it? They are saying that we are reducing their capital, but they have accumulated profits. If they have accumulated profits and they are reducing their share, share capital and they are giving money to the shareholder, then also we will consider this as a deemed dividend taxable in the hands of shareholder, right? This was from 222A to 222D. And the last is 
222A, which is something important. This is something important. 222A is, first of all, 222A is applicable only for closely held company. That is mainly for private companies or public companies which are not listed. So it is only applicable only in the case of closely held companies, that is private companies. If private companies give loan to their shareholder, if they give loan to their shareholders, right? These are, they, these are private companies, right? Closely held companies. They are giving loan to the shareholders. And actually they are not giving loan. They are giving money to the shareholders. And because these are private companies, nobody will, uh, will, uh, will say that please uh, repay the loan, right? No, nobody will say the repay the loan because why? These are very private companies. So actually what these companies are doing is they are paying dividend to the shareholder. To which shareholder who holds at least 10% of equity shares, 10% of voting rights in this company. So if this, let's say Z Private Limited is a closely held company, is a closely held company, it's a private company. And if uh, closely held company means private companies also and the companies who are not listed also, right? So it's a closely held company and there is a shareholder Mr. A and who holds at least, at least the second condition is, first condition is private companies, closely held companies. Second condition is they are giving loan to the shareholder who hold at least 10% or more share of this company, 10% or more. And which kind of shares? Voting right shares, that is equity shares. So if we give loan to such shareholder or we give loan to their relatives, right here, we are giving loan to Mr. A, that is a shareholder or to Mr. A relative, that is Mrs. A, or we are giving loan to any concern where such shareholder has a substantial interest, where such we are giving loan to, let's say, ABC and Associates, where Mr. A has substantial interest, substantial interest, you understand, where, where he has interest of 20% or more profits, where he has interest of 20% or more ownership. That is called substantial interest. See, I have discussed with you two percentages. One is 10%, other is 20%. 10%, when you have to see 10%, we are such a company where our shareholder is holding 10% or here you will see 10%. And you are such a company who is giving to such a concern where such shareholder has substantial interest. So in this concern, we have to see 20%, right? 20% or more. Even if it is 20% substantial ownership, if it is more than 20%, obviously it is substantial ownership. So if you are a close, close, closely held company and if you are giving a loan to shareholder or to their relative or to any concern where such shareholder has substantial interest. Let's say this is a partnership firm where A has more than 20% of uh, interest over here. So if you give the loan to such a concern also, it will be deemed that is as if you are paying dividend, as if you are paying dividend and it will be taxable in the hands of shareholder. It will be taxable in the hands of shareholder. Got it? But yes. If this company is into banking business, if this company is into banking business, then we will say no, then this provision will not apply. So if this company is the nature of such businesses, uh, giving loans, lending the money, then it will, it will be said, then 222E will not apply, right? Or if uh, this is a kind of, we are, we are giving actually loan, it, actually it is not a loan, but it is a trade advance. He is supplying something and we are giving trade advance to them. Then also it will not be considered as dividend. Trade advance is not considered as dividend, right? So this was mainly 222E. This was something important. There's some important points also. Some of the points I've already discussed. And this is not that important uh, point. Okay, let me discuss this point also. With you last point otherwise only one point will be left so no need to uh, leave that point also so it says that once this loan is given to this shareholder once the loan is given to the shareholders it will be considered as dividend it will be considered as dividend and this is taxable under the in the name of that's this per person as deemed dividend so let's say we have given a loan we have given a loan of two lakh rupees to him to the extent of accumulated profit it will not, it will be considered as deemed dividend. So this person has to pay tax. This person has to pay tax, right? Let's say, let's say now Z private limited is giving actual dividend to shareholder. Let's say if they are giving actual dividend to shareholder, okay, then also it will be considered as dividend. But let's say now we are pay, giving him actual dividend of 2 lakh. We are giving actual dividend of 2 lakh. But right now what we are doing is we are saying, A, we have given you 2 lakh loan in the past. We have given you 2 lakh loan in the past. So now we are adjusting that loan against such dividend. So now, right now we are giving you 2 lakh dividend. 
but we are adjusting that loan. So what amount we are paying to you? Zero. Now we are adjusting that loan. So should we make this two lakh also dividend in the hands of Mr. A? No, because this now this actual dividend is now getting adjusted with the previous dividend, right? So he will not pay the tax twice. So in this case, if this amount is getting adjusted, then we will he will not pay the tax twice, right? This point was not although very important for examination, but still it's part of 222E. That is the reason I have discussed this point also. Got it? So this was all about uh, IFOS chapter. And I believe that you have liked this uh, revision series also. And I'm able to, I think it's more than two hours now, but are we, we are able to complete this IFOS thoroughly. Thank you so much. Bye and take care.